Hi everyone, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. Uh, every Friday, we interview a creative to look at their work and discuss their approach to filmmaking. This week, I'm joined by Andrea Clayback, who's worked on HBO's Watchmen, Elysium, and Chappie, among so many other films. Hi, Andrea. Welcome to the show. Hi. Nice to be here. So I guess, well, I, to start off, you started in Canada and you made the trip to L.A. So there's a lot of people from around the world who want to get into Hollywood. So what would you suggest for someone who's just starting out, how they can make it in? That's a good question. I mean, for me, I... I feel like I kind of came to LA sort of after um, a number of sort of bigger projects. So I feel like it wasn't as kind of huge of a transition. Um, I definitely work with a lot of people um, that do that transition really early. And I don't know, I think um, kind of coming in and being open to, you know, to learning and trying different roles potentially, um, even around, you know, what you're going for, I think would be, is helpful. And it ultimately, it's a city about, you know, meeting people and connecting and, and getting um, opportunities that way, really, which I found personally quite different than in Vancouver, uh, where I'm from, uh, just in terms of the ease of connecting, people are just really open in, in Hollywood and Los Angeles in general. So, you know, kind of just getting out there, going to events, uh, meeting, meeting as many people as you can, of course, right now, that's not a thing. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> online, you know, doing as much like, you know, appearing in these virtual events and, and trying to connect with people socially, like, so through social media, I think is probably what I would recommend. Now, um, I asked this of, of other people I've interviewed, but you know, in the industry, I find in, in the different crafts, people tend to get really focused on the software or really focused on a particular area of the craft. Um, is there something in color correction that isn't being talked about or isn't being highlighted that you think people should be talking about more and, and why? Yeah, I mean, I, I get that a lot um, after doing, you know, talks about projects or whatever, and then have like very direct questions about software. Like, what did, what did you use to do that, to get that look or whatever? And um, I'm, my, my process is very much, and I think a lot of colorists is very intuitive and we learn the tools and the software, obviously that's like re a big requirement, but um, it kind of becomes one of those things. I always kind of use that um, uh, analogy about a painter, you know, generally asking a painter what paintbrushes they use. It's kind of like that. I mean, that's a little, little corny, but um, I feel like the thing that we don't talk about a lot and we're starting to talk about more is just that sort of those people skills, uh, working in a room um, with multiple you know, you know, personalities. I don't mean one person with multiple personalities, but multiple people um, uh, who have different roles. And I think, you know, the skill a, a colorist has usually to navigate uh, different personalities and, and, you know, kind of get to that vision and then do the work within that. Um, it can be kind of a social job. And I think in my, my experience, that's been um, a big part of what I feel like has been my success. So. Now you've worked on some really amazing projects. What would you say is um, a scene or a moment that you're, you're, I guess, most proud of because of the challenge it gave you and, and the way you made it look? I think um, one of the uh, a, a sort of independent film uh, or uh, of the recent years uh, called Mandy uh, was one that I think probably pushed me creatively to uh, you know a, a different level, and I think it just came from the director being um, just very firm in his mind as how he wanted this film to look. But it was quite you know if anybody's seen this film, it's quite colorful and quite extreme in terms of the use of color, but also quite a meaningful use of that color. So yes, in some cases, very overboard, but very um, purposeful. And for me, uh, I found initially starting to work on that, I did sort of look development for that film. So a variety of, of scenes that we really pushed um, and pulled uh, in different directions. I found that going that far was was it was it kind of went outside of my comfort zone as to okay what is this right like how do I know what looks right anymore um because it's, it can be very like out of like you know it's very magenta very pink or very red in some scenes and that can really 
kind of mess with your autocorrects. You know, I'm very used to that neutral look and trying to getting, you know, getting around that and creating something that's interesting that way. So for me, that project was uh, was a, hu- a big challenge just in kind of like, okay, now I'm stepping into sort of a new world and trying to figure out how my taste applied <laughs> uh, with such extreme correction or grade, I should say. Um, and I just found that I just kind of felt like went into it. Obviously, a lot of it was directed by the director uh, and the DP, but I feel like I, I started to lean into it. And then it, that became like my new level and understanding, you know, what those colors meant and why we were doing them really helped me to kind of, you know, navigate and, and get it to the place where it ended up. How did you approach look development for that? Because I've, I've never really talked to anyone about look development <laughs> for a project. Yeah. I mean, it's something that we do, you know, commonly just in our setup, I think in, in most, especially feature films or episodic uh, TV, you know, you have to work with the DP and the director or, or the showrunners to, you know, establish what that look is. Um, and usually you're doing that just up front and then kind of, so I, I like to sort of dedicate separate time for that. Um, and different projects have had uh, different needs or different, you know, needing to finish in another country, for example, or, uh, you know, a place where I can't go to where I'm not able to sort of leave where I'm a project I'm working to go. So sometimes I'll work if I have a really good relationship in that particular film uh, was Benjamin Loeb. So a DP that I've worked with many times before. Um, and we had, a, you know, we had a language and a history of working together and collaboration that he wanted to bring in. So I think for that, what we did is it could be as little as, you know, a few scenes from a film or uh, that, you know, setting up the test or creating LUTs with the DP early on, just sort of, this is the look before they go and shoot. Um, In Mandy's particular case, we did that. And then also um, um, graded most of the film um, in terms of just, you know, setting the look for about, I would say a little over an hour of material. that really pushed it, you know, further in some ways and, and less in other ways than where it ended up. But it's kind of an interesting process because it allows two or three colorists potentially to kind of jump in and uh, give their own take on it to sort of like feed into the vision, um, which I find is really kind of exciting. Now, there's a couple of things in there because I think about Mandy and I haven't had a chance to see it yet, but I think about the different uh, genres that you might have to work on. And they all mm. set, tend to have... Um, like a particular look like not a particular look but sort of a style like if you, a lot of times if you go to Mexico it's going to have that sort of uh, yellowish orange mm-hmm. look uh, or yeah. if it's a sci-fi film it might be cooler so how do you mm-hmm. still um, allow yourself or I guess working within those frameworks that the director might want how do you sh- still make sure that you have some creative freedom that you can uh give your own stamp, but still respect the, the genre's approach. Yeah, I mean, I try, again, try to spend a lot of time early on or upfront. So whether it's before, you know, I get to come on a project before they start shooting my pre-production, usually it's a lot of conversations with DP of what they're going for. And then I'm kind of softly, you know, working alongside sort of like researching and kind of getting a sense of what they're thinking. Um, and then I usually start to, even before we start grading, I will start to bring um, ideas forth. Just, oh, what about this this movie kind of, you know, or this inspiration? What about this painting? Or what about these photographs? Or what about, what do you think? Just to kind of, you know, not mess with them, but kind of give them a little bit of where, how I've reacted to the content so far. And that can usually be really fun because they'll, you know, I always bring some like something that's a little bit different. And then that kind of sets the tone for me in terms of like what my creative, um, co- you know, contribution is going to be. And then once we get to the grade, then usually it's like, oh, remember when we were talking about that? Okay, more like that. Let's let's try that. Um, if I'm not doing as early on, but I'm still, you know, trying to bring that um, bit of that collaborative collaborative experience in, then I'll still do that at the beginning and sort of set aside some time to just experiment and throw things left, right and center, um, just to kind of shake things up a little bit and, and, and keep things a little lighter at the beginning. So we're not just kind of like going straight into, okay, this is the exact look we want. Because a lot of the times the content, you know, what's actually shot can go in a slightly different way. And I might see that um, versus you know, the team might see it differently. So usually by the time I'm getting involved and in actually moving the image around, um, we've kind of established that relationship that 
okay, Andrea, why don't you try something? Like, just show us something. Um, and so usually if I'm able to give, it, I'm most, most commonly I'm able to give something that's a little bit different. And they're like, okay, cool, that's great. So then we kind of, you know, establish a language about what that would be called. And then we, we you know, that starts to weave its way throughout the film. And then usually by the end of the film, I'm kind of given, it's kind of handed a little bit to me and say, okay, you know how this works. So any new visual effects, any shots that come in, just go ahead do what you think. If there's any questions you have, just let us know. And then they kind of come back for a review. So um, yeah, it's just sort of more establishing that relationship and, and kind of finding, you know, what the boundaries are and like where people, what they want from you. Um, and always kind of playing within that. And then just, you know, kind of like pushing it a little bit here and there when you think you have the, the opportunity to. Now you talked about referencing, you know, a movie or a painting or something. Do you have like a essentially a book or a, a Google doc that you keep all your, your likes, I guess, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I tried years ago to like start a big Lightroom library of just like keeping everything like very, you know, um, organized and tagged with all these things. Uh, and recently Lawrence share came up with a very cool app, uh, like online um, community that's called shop deck. That's really helpful. I find um, I'm kind of a bit of all over uh, now, but I, I generally have just like a huge image library that I try to, you know, keep somewhat organized. And then a lot of the times for, you know, a new project that comes up um, that the, whenever I get a reference, I'll just kind of like, okay, look at the time frame that we're talking about and then I try to specifically find you know images from different mediums so I, I have a I keep a lot of books like art books like on painting just because it helps me have like you know that hard copy representation of something and the colors and palettes and things like that so that kind of art history <laughs> those art history books that you know are definitely a go-to for me and then it's it's really is just like the the you know the internet um a shot deck is really great and then typically uh, late, more lately, I'm just making my own mood boards and kind of just collecting those into like one place. But um, yeah, the, the image library is pretty <laughs> pretty significant. I just wish I had. I just wish it was a little bit more organized so I could like type you know one word and get where I want. But um, usually, I'm ki I can find that that sort of genre, the group of images that I'm looking for, and then you know go through my memory to find what it is that I have, or or just kind of do the typical Google search. You know that always works. Is there a particular artist that you uh, like to follow, I guess you could say? I, uh, in terms of uh, painting, I, I'd like, I love Dutch realism uh, personally, just, it always just helps me kind of, it helped me really to study lighting and how people see lighting um, in order to paint it, you know, to recreate it. And so I love those images. Um, but at the same time, I also just love, you know, like, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, pretty much like a majority of like romantic paintings or or Renaissance. Like I, I love just that sort of like history uh, when a um, time where it was just kind of like the major artists coming out, you know, like Michelangelo and Leonardo. So uh, the classics are always something that I go back to. But I would say, yeah, Dutch Dutch realism is one that really helps me define for filmmaking a lot. That's interesting because I've, I've talked to a lot of colorists and a lot have referred to Dutch realism. Yeah. So I wonder, wonder what yeah. it is about it that is attracting everyone. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's like the quality of light that they are able to capture and it was very new. It's kind of like a, um, and there's a lot of aesthetic now in the last few years, especially in trying to sort of get digital images into, I think that more filmic way, especially when red camera first came out or, you know, Aries camera was, was kind of coming into the norm, I think a lot of people wanted to create a filmic look and looking at film was helpful, but I think it, it's, it's interesting to go back and look at how people see light kind of fall on objects, you know, in a natural sense. And I think there's just something about it that's got that magical uh, look and feel to it that's quite real, but it's also a little bit like fantastical. So I think, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's what it is. I could totally guess. I totally get the uh, the desire to make back in the day to make digital look like film, but it was very frustrating mm -hmm. from a post perspective to like get footage 100%. and be yeah. like, "Hey, can you make this look like film?" <laughs> and it was totally. like, yes, yeah, it's not shot that way, but okay. Um, yeah, exactly. 
how for as a because essentially you're usually utilizing color as a storytelling tool so what do you look for in the script uh or in the film to or in the television show to uh you know or what is it that you like to look for from a storytelling point of view i guess in the script or show i think often finding out you know especially from the the creators uh filmmakers themselves like what their their you know ultimate vision is what they want people to feel at certain parts or when things they want to be more highlighted and what's like the overall like overarching theme um or meaning behind certain things I think is super helpful. When I look at scripts, usually I'm I'm kind of separating them out by, um, often it's for whatever reason, it's like, it's this time or this location. And then trying to find meaning in those places, like why are they here? What's happening at this part of the story? Is there, is there you know, should this play, you know, uh, you know, like, is it, is it, are we looking at like a magic realism thing? Is it like fantasy? Is this very, supposed to be grounded in reality. Um, so really finding the tone uh, from each kind of major scene, I guess, really helps me. And then, and often I'm dividing them up by like uh, time, you know, like I, movies I've been working on, on a lot lately have been, you know, starting in a certain time period and then, you know, ending in another time period. So that's really helps to define and then work on the color story throughout the film. So if there's, um, if it starts one way and ends away or a certain, you know, work on a certain character, if they are going through a journey, you know, do we adjust the, so their surroundings slightly more, you know, more than that's already shot to reflect, you know, uh, the outcome or like what's changed for them. So it's usually trying to find a combination of, you know, characters and the meanings around them individually within the script. And then also the, the sort of surroundings, the environments why we're in those and, you know, what they each individually mean and where they are, you know, in the story and what I could give in terms of, would it be interesting if this was this played a little bit darker, you know, and we don't, we don't really see the details that are going on so that when we get to the next scene, you know, the audience is more engaged looking for certain things, you know, that kind of thing. And also just finding out, is there any details that you really want to highlight that would be helpful when you're reading a script, you're often, you know, you process that differently when you see it can, can pass you by. So, Sort of, I usually identify things. Like, oh, that that when I read that, that was really, um, that really meant something to me. So, how can I bring that out in terms of the visual? How do you? Because um, you talked about looking at is it magic of realism or what have you, uh, and then looking at the characters and everything. But how do you do or tackle a film where, um, you know, that blends? Like I think about. Watchmen and we have superheroes but it's also a dark realistic mm -hmm. story or I think you know like these a lot of um, films are going to are blending the genres nowadays so how do you tackle something mm -hmm. like that uh, in in terms of figuring out your approach yeah well I, I I'm a fan of like liking those looks to be really distinct um, even within you know within the singular world but then not trying to understand or find something that ties it together and keeps it the same show, for example, right? So, um, you know, Watchmen's a great example. And again, that's another one where I, you know, kind of strictly did look development. So I wasn't involved as much uh, towards the actual episodic grade, but um, in setting that up, similarly, um, to finding actually very bold, distinct looks uh, separately, this is what this is. Okay, this is the on-screen, um, you know, TV with it, the show within a show, whatever which was in that um, that show that we had. Like, let's just define that look. What's really really bold about that? What can we bring out in that? And then looking at like, what's the sort of like the sort of everyday neutral reality? What's a like looking back a flashback look like? So I like to really go push those each in very strong ways. Um, and then like see them come together. And then usually it's, it's all over the place, right? Like not, not in a bad way, but usually, you know, there's, there's things that kind of make it look like a, a, you know, a variety of different <laughs> movies or, or, or shows. So then at that point, um, it's sort of like this method that I do. It's like keeping them out of context and pulling them together and then trying to find that like tying line that will 
make it look like the same. So uh, like if you said Elysium early on, that was a big one where, you know, we had two different worlds. So like the Mexico City, which represented at Los Angeles, you know, uh, in whatever future that was, uh, 2000 and something, 40 something. And, uh, and then we had, you know, Elysium, which was this pristine, you know, um, space habitation planet, not really, you know, a safe space station, I guess you call it. Uh, I haven't talked about that maybe in a long time, so I forget what the, the lingo is. But, yeah. um, but you had these like distinct worlds, right? Two worlds. And that was what we did with that. We really pushed, you know, Elysium, uh, all those, you know, scenes, which were shot in Vancouver, um, but really pushed that look, which ha ha naturally had a cooler vibe, you know, it was like, uh, sunny and cloudy, but like the sort of northern light. So it had a little bit of a different look, which really suited that sort of space light feel like that sort of moon and like um, sort of almost like um, false light kind of feel. So we really pushed that look. And then again, on Earth, you know, we had different, you know, a different place on Earth where uh, the light was different. Again, like you said, like it's a little orange, a little bit, you know, um, more dusty, obviously, where they were shooting. And so playing those really distinctly. And then when we started to cut, there was this one big scene that I remember, you know, showing a lot where, where they're cutting back and forth. It's like, there's a, something going on. There's an action scene, there's a fight, there's like explosions and we're cutting up to Elysium and seeing Jodie Foster, um, you know, on, on her, you know, in her world. And they were really different, you know, uh, on purpose. But then it was trying to find out like, you know, how do we get those to line up? And a lot, end up, what I ended up doing is kind of bringing elements in from both sides you know, to blend them a little bit better. Um, but still, you know, they have their own unique look, but then, you know, skin tones, for example, would have like the right contrast or the black levels would be closer, you know, to the same. Um, and then we sort of just play around with balance and kind of get get different things, but like pulling in a certain blue color into both sides, you know, would be something, for example, that would just help tie those things together thematically. And I think that that is, you know, something I probably use on every single project I do. Now, was there a scene uh, or a, a film in your career that was um, challenging and uh, a tough project, but you're that you were able to pull through that you're, uh, you know, you sort of are like, wow, I, I can't believe I, I pulled that through and made it work. <laughs> yeah, well, we were just talking about Elysium and that was at the time, like the biggest, you know, uh, budget film I had ever worked on and was lucky to get that collaborative experience with uh, Neil Blomkamp, the director, who was basically said, like, try, try what you think, you know, what do you think would look good? And I, often I was like, I don't know, I'd make it look real, you know, um, and the, the biggest scene in that movie in terms of a from a grading perspective was because it was big visual effects. It was, uh, you know, Matt Damon essentially like fighting with a droid. Or I think at the no you know spoiler alert he like literally rips the head off the droid at the end and like throws it um, you know into the sand. This is after it's I think it was a roughly like eight minute action scene that you know it was it take place in like three different locations and again that was the one that ended cutting back and forth um, to the, the to Elysium in the sky and but that scene itself was shot over the course I think three days and then all times of day. So when it started, you know, and of course, er almost every shot, it was a visual effect shot, had either a droid, like a guy in a gray suit um, that was, you know, acting and, and doing, the, doing the stunts, or it, there was, you know, a, some kind of vehicle flying in or whatever. So every shot was a visual effect, um, but there was a lot of mismatching in terms of just like the lighting direction, time of day, how much dust was in the air. Um, so I remember looking at that scene being like oh god like <laughs> this one's gonna really take a long time just be, just to also to kind of keep that real look that sort of like very untouched feel you know do we didn't want it to look graded you know which you, it's easy to hide stuff like that in heavier grades I feel like but but this one we really wanted to it to look like you know you could be in that scene it wasn't like modified in a real you know fantasy way so you know, for me, that one was just like focusing on it, spending a lot of time helping the visual effects team. So I worked on pre-grading a lot of the VFX shots there. Um, in some cases, you know, when I we were changing light direction, I was giving them references for that so that they could apply that into uh, their visual effects. So that, you know, the droid had the right highlights in the right place, et cetera. And it was a lot of shots and it was obviously very cutty, <laughs> very cutty scene, but getting through it really taught me. I think it really changed my eye strongly in terms of like the day lit, that neutral daylight, because 
Um, and again, going back to paintings or whatever, it's like trying to find like, where would that light source be? What would I change here to get those two to match, you know? And um, it was very, to me, I felt like I was probably spent like in and out a few weeks on that scene. And I mean, over the course of probably, you know, a few months, but um, yeah, I feel like it really, it really tuned my eye uh, in terms of like everything I did after that point. <laughs> I can very quickly see like, oh, that's wrong. You know, uh, I need to, I can fix that. So um, it was, it was one of those kind of boot camps in terms of uh, natural light and, uh, and grading for sure. <laughs> so I, I have one last question that I ask everyone I've been interviewing. We've been in this pandemic, uh, a lot of areas in the world are shut down so that people aren't going out and uh, interacting or whatever. So a lot of people are watching television. Is there a show or a movie that you found on uh streaming services that you think people should check out <laughs> there's two um uh, well um no so i'm I, you see I, I drink as i drink my schitt's creek mug because i'm canadian also and yeah. this was this was uh coming back to schitt's creek was um was really good for my heart uh, in the pandemic being away from my family and being away from canada this whole time um honestly that it like changed my whole outlook and I know it sounds silly but it really was uh one of those shows I just I, I tell everybody if they're in a state where they're like I don't know what to watch like you gotta watch Shit's Creek it's my favorite uh, I just watched the Queen's Gambit though uh okay. finally finished that series which I think is wonderful um really really fun engaging not a you know not a super long you know series but beautiful um and yeah I, that one I would definitely recommend that one's on Netflix, I think. So yeah. well, thank you so much for letting me interview. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem. Um, I do want to say if you like Shits Creek, check out Ted Lasso. Oh, Ted Lasso. Okay. Yeah. That's on Apple. Writing TV. that down. <laughs> okay. Gonna uh, do that. Gonna do that. So there's only so many times you can watch Shits Creek. That's really yeah, at the end exactly. of the day. <laughs> Well, thanks so much and uh, have a good weekend. Awesome. Thanks, you too. Right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.